a common question I hear is how do we know, how can I know what direction to hatch or to cross hatch? How do I know when I'm doing a drawing from a photo or from a scene in front of me, what direction to do all of these lines? It looks easy enough when I see what someone else has chosen to do, but it's not so straightforward for me to know when I'm looking at a photo, say, what direction to put the lines. I thought hard about how I choose what direction I put my lines in, and I realized it really comes down to three main principles. What I want to do is tell you what those three principles are, and then I want to show you how they look in a number of drawing examples, because really it's the sort of thing which is best understood in the context of how it looks in practice, because the actual principles are not that difficult, and knowing them is not the issue, but knowing how to apply them, knowing what they look like or how they might look with different sorts of subjects, I think is the most helpful way to learn how to choose them ourselves. And while there are three, the bulk of the examples are really going to be looking at and considering the first two, because the third one, maybe the most simple one, is simply how much time we have available to do our drawing because some choices of direction for hatching or cross hatching will take a lot longer to do in our drawing than others. But if time is not an issue, we really come now down to two main indicators for me in my working out what direction I cross hatch or hatch. And they are the underlying form of the structure that I'm putting the hatching lines on and clarity. What line direction will either preserve or create greater clarity within my scene so that what we're looking at becomes as easy to see as possible. We'll come back to this example a bit later. Let's look at what this means in practice with my choices with some more straightforward examples. I think rocks are a great subject to see the principle of choosing directions for our hatching lines that indicate conform with the underlying form of the rock because rocks don't have any predetermined form. Here I've done hatching lines that curve under that show the direction that the curve of the rock is following. Here we have a cascading waterfall. Here we have lines coming this way, this way and this way indicating the curvature of the rock there. Here, these lines come straight down because this plane is coming straight down. But under here, the lines go back because the rock's curving under itself. But over here, this rock here is sloping forwards, and so these lines slope forward. These lines slope forward, but at even a more shallow angle to reflect the fact that this is the direction of the rock. Over here, we have quite a three-dimensional sense to our hatching. Again, we have hatching that comes in one direction, another direction, another direction. If we look here, we can see that hatching actually lets us give form to what we're seeing, really does add clarity to what we're looking at. So again, we can see that there are sections where the lines change direction, and in this case, become thicker to not just look darker, but to give a sense of what we're seeing is changing direction. Over here on this headland, much lighter lines, but we're still bringing them in a sense in a couple of planes of curving over the top of this fairly weathered headland. However, for North Head that we're looking at here on Sydney Harbour, along here, there's pretty much a straight drop down into the ocean. And so our lines are straight lines. And we make very clear that this geologically looks very different to this, to help define and make clear the form that we have underneath. We see that down here, the hatching over the trunk is partly done in two curves to show that there's a roundedness that goes in and then comes out and curves around again because of the way this tree has formed. We also get to see with the canopy here, how the hatching directions 
come down at an angle to reflect the fact that these are the shadows that are being cast as the canopy curves under away from the light. Whether it's a light shade effect that we're trying to create or whether it's a much darker one, we curve our lines under to represent the curvature that we see in various parts of the canopy. Sometimes we have a much simpler subject, but again, you can see I've changed my line directions depending on the underlying form. And I do this whether I'm trying to create the effect of the actual color or of the shade and shadow or of both. You'll notice that with this shadow under the magpie, my hatching lines indicate the underlying form of the grass. I'm actually not drawing the grass here. I'm drawing the shadow on the grass, but I'm keeping my hatching lines reflecting the form that the grass has underneath. With this old tree stump, I chose not to do my hatching lines going around the curves as I usually do, because I felt that with this chopped off decaying tree stump, I had all these circular lines already. And what I wanted to emphasize was the contrasting vertical lines going down to the ground. I felt that this created greater clarity with the form than repeating these circular lines on the outside. Now, when it comes to architecture, when it comes to buildings, when we're wanting to reflect the underlying form, then for me, that also includes the underlying perspective angles of the part of the building that we're looking at. So in looking at this overhanging cornice, and we're looking straight on, as we move away from the center point, the angle goes from being straight up to move in like this and straight up to move in like this. And that's shown in these outer lines of the building. However, whereas for this shadow being cast on the top of the entablature, I've come straight down to represent the fact that from a perspective point of view, there is no perspective distortion here. For the gutter in here, I've done vertical line between two lines very close together because I felt that there were so many bands of lines that I've represented horizontally that if I just put some more horizontal lines here, which would have been much quicker, it would tend to look a bit like lines that are representing a form that's actually very different to this. You'll notice here with this pathway that I've done the same thing as I've done up here, but flipped. So I've got pretty much vertical lines straight ahead as I move away, these lines angle this way. And as I move down the street, these hatching lines, they are very faint that you may not even see them very clearly come out this way. That again echoes the underlying perspective of the building. Here we have lots of vertical lines by nature of the architecture with the columns and the windows and the indents. And so with all of the vertical lines, I didn't want to use any vertical lines unless I had to, because I felt they would get lost in the lines for the architecture. So for these recessed arched areas that were totally in shade on the left-hand side, I've used horizontal lines, but again, I've drawn them following the perspective angle. We have eye level somewhere, somewhere about here. And so above this, the lines slowly start to get more and more and particularly in the tops of the arches, we can see the angles more and more. Below that, they're more horizontal going the other way. The same thing here. Notice that by doing my hatching in this direction for the left side arch of the doorway, but by using vertical lines for the shadowed area through the doorway, we create clarity in terms of what we're looking at and what's happening there. This drawing of Whitby Abbey certainly reflects the fact that some choices take more time. It took me a lot longer to be working on the, the curves of this structure with all these horizontal lines going up the various architectural elements. And yet, it let me reflect the perspective angles, horizontal lines across eye level that in this straight section, shift and follow the perspective angles 
as they move up. And on the other sections, their roundedness becomes more round as it goes higher and more straight as it comes back towards eye level. This is a good example, I think, of the hatching lines reflecting the perspective angles. If we look at this wall, where we do have this straight wall, and we can see that at eye level, we come across with horizontal lines across all parts of our hatching from here to here to here to here and to here. But as we go above eye level, we can see that the hatching direction changes quite dramatically. On these curved surfaces, if we look at this section here, we see that at eye level, these lines are horizontal. Below eye level, they curve with increasing roundness in one direction, and above eye level, the same thing, but with the other direction. For the ground here, the value was all pretty much the same, the darkness or lightness, but I did the lines in a separate direction to give visual clarity from all the other sections that were hatched. And the same with this step here, cast a shadow, so small vertical lines, that change direction in contrast to the lines above to one side and below it to help give clarity to what we're seeing. You'll notice up here in the arch, I've done my hatching straight up and down at the top and coming down this way on the right hand side and coming down at increasing angle on the other side. These are the choices I make to help define the underlying form better. But it's not just in architecture. If we look at this bronze imperial eagle from Vienna, I've used hatching choices here to reflect the curving edge of this wing. But then as the wing has come closer to the body, I've actually changed direction to represent the curved sections of the wing muscles that are reflected in the feathers on top. On this side, I've kept it pretty much all at angles, but even here you can see that I've changed from curving under up here, changing direction as I come around. For the eagle's face, you can see that I've curved my lines in sections to follow the curving form of the face. And the same thing in the other direction for the beak. And for the wings, I've used lines that both go this way, that reflect the form of the wing that way, but I've also used lines that go this way because I needed a very dark value for this wing. So there were going to be a lot of lines. So I could afford to use a couple of helpful directions that together, I think, create a sense, even though the value is so dark, that give a sense of curvature of this. And I think this works very well when we have architecture and nature combined. With these gates here, with these gate posts here, I chose to do horizontal lines. Vertical ones would have been faster, but there were lots of vertical lines here already with the railings of the gate and the fence and what I was doing down here and with the garden. So I thought horizontal lines, a better contrast, a stronger contrast. But with these lines coming down along here, I used horizontal lines. But with all this foliage, I've used quite a few different directions to create separation. Over here, I've got lines angled this way. These leaves that are closest, they come down and they come around. This tree behind has looser lines and they curve more under than these ones have. In contrast, these ones here come straight down more these ones here angle in the opposite direction. The lines for this large shrub here come down this way and down the other way on the other side, creating a sense of the roundness of the shrub. In this drawing of a wharf on Sydney Harbour, there were lots and lots of vertical lines. So I needed to do some hatching for the shadow being cast on this wall from this overhanging section above. And I felt that if I did vertical lines, they would end up confusing visually what was happening with all of these vertical lines that I'd drawn as part of the structure. So I used lines at 45 degrees. 
This was quite a complex scene for Hatchin. In fact, basically, with the exception of some of the lines for some of the branches, this whole scene is virtually created from Hatchin. Learning to vary our marks for both reflecting the underlying form and for overall clarity of our scene is incredibly helpful when we have incredibly complex scenes, but also controlling our line heaviness and the effects that we create so that as this unsealed road moves into the distance, the lines become lighter and the hatching becomes lighter and it gives us a sense that it's curving away under all of this foliage on top. But with this foliage, I've used very different marks to create the shade and the shadow of this, if you like, I think in my mind, the main part of the drawing, this large overhanging section of a tree. I've used different marks to show this different coloured tree that's closer, different type of tree. And then I've combined hatching in different directions with different marks for different types of vegetation that's closer to us. But again, all the time making slight changes in the angle that in my mind represent the form, the, if you like, surface form of these shrubs. Now, this road is unsealed, so it's rutted where the wheels of a vehicle would be. And so my lines, my hatch lines, go in at least three sections for these closer lines. We have, if you like, the first section, and then there's the rut, the second section, and the rut, and the third section, and the rut. So we create a sense of what the surface looks like by the hatching lines that we've drawn to capture the shadows of the branches that go over the road. Well, there are lots of rocks here, and we can see if we look at this rock over here, that in fact, yes, the hatching lines indicate the curvature of the rock and the different faceted planes that have been formed over the years. We see the same thing here, and then here where the lines curve around. Here, there's a rough curvature of this direction from top lines, middle lines, and bottom lines. Over here, it goes this way. If we look from here to here, though, we do see there is an angling that ties up with the perspective angles as well for this rock. And above at the top, we see the lines angle back more steeply to represent that's a flatter surface. Even down here on this bottom step, we can see that we've got several stages of hatching to create a sense of roundness here. Whereas over here, where there's no rocks, there's just a lot of leaf litter and stuff, my lines generally start off vertically and then angle down more and then shallow a little to represent a, a cascading down level of unevenness, but to represent that with my lines. A lot of the foliage, particularly the further away foliage, is vertical. So to create clarity, distinctiveness between the foliage and my tree trunks, I've used horizontal lines to represent the curvature of the trunk. And particularly with this large trunk close here, you can see there is quite a roundness in the lines that are being drawn. And I think that helps to not just indicate that this is different and it's a tree, but to make it look more three-dimensional. Again, we can see the foliage for this bush here, though, isn't, isn't just vertical. It's not the same as these really distant ones, but there is quite distinct curving under and around of the lines to indicate the overall shape of the outer edge of foliage. G'day, I'm Stephen Travis. Look, I hope this run through of how I do my lines and the sorts of lines I've chosen for particular parts to use is helpful in giving you some idea of how to make your own choices with the scenes that you have to draw and that the principles of reflecting the underlying form to create clarity in the various elements that we're looking at and also to be realistic with the time that we have available are helpful. This continues to be a, a difficult area for people. Once we get into the right way of thinking, though, then we almost start to choose the best angles for our hatching intuitively. There'll always be the odd thing where we think, gosh, what's going to happen there? There's a few choices. I'm not sure what's the best one. But generally, by practice, by repetition, and by looking at what we've done and 
choosing to make changes with the next drawing if we don't think it's worked as well as we would have liked is a great way to improve and to get to the point where we start to make good choices almost without thinking. But look, whatever we're drawing, whether we're hatching or not, however the hatching turns out, make sure you have fun. I'll see you next time. Bye.